plots may be simple or complex, but suspense and climatic progress from one incident to another are essential. Every incident in a fictional work should have some bearing on the climax or denouement, and any denouement which is not the inevitable result of the preceding incidents is awkward and unliterary. The words of H.P. Lovecraft. Now tonight's story is very much written in the style of Lovecraft. Not an easy style to pull off, but one I think has been done very, very well this evening. Another story from Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up, so you could share your stories with me and I could read them all for you. And you are in for a bit of a treat this evening, my dear friends. I wish you all the chance to sit back and relax with your favourite drink. And once again, listen. When the persistent existential crisis finally started weighing my sanity down, the minutiae stature of my persona started to dwindle, and the dream of longevity became long forgotten. I then decided to leave my artificially lit abode in search of more natural luminescence. When the thoughts of self-annihilation started fondling with my sanity, and my health degraded even further, I decided to let myself out into the woods with whatever ounce of energy I had in my consumptive shell to prevent those obnoxious thoughts from interfering with my conscience. I decided to move to Vermont. As for the queer stillness and calmness of my brain, even after all these hideous cataclysms, is another inexplicable prospect. To say it was all a product of some wild, hideous imagination is just to blatantly ignore the plainest facts of my tenure. To say it was an adverse effect of my persistent ailment, or just pure, unearthly phantasms, is just plain stupidity, and disgusted me when Nancy regarded it with a pinch of her unbearable laughter, her answer to everything, a detestable laughter followed by her toothy grin. Every reflection held the same grotesqueness in my squalid, Sullen, sparsely lit home, wearied by the same melancholic sight, I tore apart every mirror before leaving, burned every work, fumes of which reminded me of my transient uproar, fame, and my equally short-lived writing career. Every little anomaly in those sinister, unlit, damp corridors reminded me of my futile decisions, flaws which resided in the nethermost point of my soul, refusing to show up. Every picture frame radiated a different tale of my short-lived career. Every little aching step I took, painfully reverberated, dictated a thousand years of struggle in my tortured ears. Tottering and floundering in the confines of my own home, my day dissipated into nothingness, and evenings into oblivions. Night. My body shudders from the very thought of the nocturnal hours. Chills run down my spine from the hideous thoughts of it. Nights were the worst of all. It brought those cries. Oh, God, those wails, those sick clamours, despite the insidious outward winds in its direction. Those shrieks, those demonic shrieks, always induced a disproportionate amount of grotesqueness in my nightly fantasies, often keeping me up in the morbid fear that I shall be mangled in the same noxious way that Nancy was. During the nocturnal hours, I felt my mental bandwidth contracting. To my mind, it all felt like a wicked phantasm created by Satan himself. A curious case of night terrors. I laughingly exclaimed this to myself, shunning the most obvious of peculiarities. As time went on, the signs became more wicked. He started to manifest more. At some point in time, it felt like he scrutinized my habits, for it would only appear when I was alone and idle, and at the nadir of my mental and physical well-being. I sometimes attributed this to my ailing body, more loneliness, which took refuge in my body, refusing to believe he exists, but the omens were crystal clear. My coming to Vermont had been an utter failure, for whence I looked, I saw traces of my failures, for this sinister place aggravated my illness and has pushed me on to the brink of my untimely extinction. My mind didn't seem to work rationally there, even transiently, for, for the nature I so dearly sought looked uninterested and inanimate. 
though even after the abhorrent nature of those woods, that cryptical place still reminded me of my melodious hours, from where everything went downhill, down unlit. The interminable patriarch of those sinister trees resided my wicked ailment, which drove my sanity to self-annihilation and extinction. Life became an existential horror for me, and it all started after I first met her. I saw her for the first time in the fall of thirty, walking briskly as if in some hurry. Her hair, though, oh, those hairs. She had exquisite red colour to her hair. It looked as if she would get lost within those woods and would never be found if it were not for those red hairs. Her aura magnified the eloquence of the place. The rays bent around her body, giving her a satisfying and elegant look. I knew I needed to talk to her. Making my way down the alley, I tried adjusting my pace to match hers, still keeping my heartbeats within scrutinization levels. The soft winter air displayed no signs of surcease. The wind had a certain crisp quality to it, a soothing aura which was now mixing with my overflowing anxiety and excitement. I was made to stop abruptly when she turned around all at once, making me stop like a deer who got caught cold up front some speeding headlines. I was the deer then. I finally yelled, Hi! A confused, yet so eloquent face looked back, and in those microseconds, eons passed for me. Every Einsteinian lecture, every Euclidean geometry, and, and all Newtonian physics took an abrupt halt, as I witnessed time dilation within normal circumstances. <laughs> I laugh upon this now. My lips convulsed in an undignified haste as I stuttered, stuttered and stuttered, finally uttering some sensible composition of words barely comprehensible. My speech was cut short as some voice straight from heaven interrupted my lustful gaze and asked me in the most innocent face ever, Sir, you look lost. May I help you? Apart from her hair, the one thing that stood out the most, which was not palpable from behind her, were those exotic eyes. Oh, those shimmering eyes, like a pale full moon shining maliciously on a cold, damp winter night. The words which next came would forever remain inexplicable to my fading sanity, the origins of which I dare not fathom in my miserable state. I somehow complimented her on her eyes. You've got beautiful eyes, ma'am. She instantly blushed, for I was no bad-looking fellow for my age. Five foot eleven, and weighing nearly a hundred and fifty-five pounds. I knew I had a pure chance here. You've got some mesmerizing gaze, too. She hit back shyly on me. From there, to cut things short, my world changed. Always revolved around her most amazingly. Whether it was a simple quiz victory at the university or, or a menacing feud, she had to know everything. Now, for once, love is a horribly difficult emotion to describe. For some impeccable personas of society, it's just a mechanism of reproduction, necessary for the continued existence of all life forms on Earth, and a severe distraction while for the loathsome genres of society the low dwellers, presumably, it's their world. And for me, she was my world. Amazingly, no one hated on us. Eons passed on, and eternities were to pass next, but something malicious hindered our ephemeral way to eternal happiness. The thing is, besides all the fantastic habits she had, she also had a corrupted one, which just plain obliterated every other. It's cancer, they said. Procrastination, I wondered, in my hyperactive mind. The corrupted habit of her. She procrastinated in everything. Her appointments, her meds, the symptoms which she ignored with morbid levity. The lump jarred a fiendish look as it grew insidiously all the way. Certain heaviness in the air surrounded us. It 
dared to engulf us in that room. The doctor, wearing a pale smile, a blank expression, continued to babble incoherently about the chances, the risk and cost-effective insurance. Dread and restrained fear drooled through her eyes as she let out a forceful smile. The smile etched into my soul, in the deepest of corners. A plethora of memories incessantly flooded my mind on the funeral day. To say I scarcely enjoyed the abysmal weather would be a sin, but it doesn't matter now. It is better to have loved and lost than never to have loved before, I reminded myself. Loving a nihilist is a hard but erudite experience. Turning him sane, swerving off nihilism, removing it from the equation is even harder. But for the sane to turn back into a nihilist is a tragedy. Unfortunately, the latter came true for my depraved nihilistic self. I decided to move back to Vermont, to spend the rest of my days in recluse, and focus once again on the betterment of my degrading writing career, which once brought me transient fame. I finally set out for Battleboro, the laughter lines accumulated through vigorous usage of superioris and resorius were slowly fading away into oblivion. The serene, picturesque scenery unfolded in front of me in a beautiful way. It looked even sinister somehow, for I was well acquainted with the legends surrounding the Vermont woods, the stories, the tales my grandparents told me when I was still a kid. I shunned my delusional thoughts, delirious with the tragic cataclysms, the grief and the overwhelming sadness it was experiencing. I got out of the motor car and trudged painfully towards my abode. The Vermont woods looked so calm and inviting. The thick canopy laden with wildlings allowed little sunlight to reach the squalid surface, the moss-covered ground stretching for a thousand miles in either way. Wildlife was sprawling in the place, bugs, insects and rodents all peacefully inhabiting the still untouched parts of the forests, still not plagued by the sins of mankind. It was still daytime when I arrived in Vermont. The atmosphere grew colder as I inched slowly towards my edifice. Thick, dark clouds formed over the horizon. Ah, the Vermont weather. I chuckled back, thinking to myself how dearly I missed the weather, as the city's garish luminescence didn't allow even reminiscing. Past moss-covered ground, overgrown bushes and vociferous fauna, I reached my destination, a cheerful and familiar face greeting me, Nancy. She was the caretaker appointed way back. The ominous signs of aging didn't hold her back from shouting my name so loudly and vehemently it may very well have been heard in the whole of Brattleboro. Her face now revealed the wrath of time, wrinkled and corrugated, hands trembling, feet tremulous still enough to carry around joyously, a face which was once smeared with elegant freckles, now displayed none. The house was the same as ever since I left it, except for a beautiful foliage of leaves gathered around aesthetically. Birds chirped monotonically around the premise. The tree line had receded back, but the branches still covered most of the facade. The crisp, raspy sound of dry leaves crunching under my feet gave my dreary mind a much-needed solace. The country wind swerved my surliness away. Smiling exultantly, I walked into my home. The first rays of evening greeted me, repelling my irritation away. The smell of wood, the sound of it creaking under my aching feet, washed my sanity with a new sense of euphoria, causes unknown. Ah, a soothing respite from my daunting ennui, I thought to myself, as I languorously skimmed past my precarious belongings. I spent most of my days huddled up in my study, making myself involved in some dreary work as every new feeling of gratification was soon washed down by persistent reminiscence and nostalgia. Sometimes betwixt inextricable work and grief, I would hear muffled, 
distant echoes of cheerful kids coming from afar, past innumerable trees and dense forests. I would then imaginatively join in on their conversations and laughs. Living in seclusion wasn't a problem as the majority of my life went in recluse. As evenings would draw closer, I would then clumsily wander around my property in hopes of finding rabbits which I'd spotted from the upstairs windows. Those little creatures reminded me of another fictional creature, Mateguas. Some evenings, when I was too ill and fragile to walk around, Nancy would accompany me in my amble pace. She would often relay to me the fantastic legends surrounding these woods, the tales of Abenaki tribe and several other mythical beasts of distinct and unclear origins. Vermont is usually associated with sprawling flora and brilliant ostentatious forests. Seldomly and, and only even then, a meager quantity of adult population would associate it with the supernatural. So, sometimes when Nancy told me the tales of Giwaka, an evil man-eating ice giant of Abenaki Indian legends similar to the Wendigo, filled my mind with dread, whilst mention of few mythical creatures sparked childhood fantasy inside of me. Miko, a mischievous raccoon, a light-hearted Abenaki trickster figure, falls in the latter category. Nancy seemed a definite connoisseur in Vermont's legends, although she never explained the origins of such fantastic erudition. My life never steered around the spectral dimension too much to have a discussion or ponder over. The prospect of the supernatural never entertained me or vied for my attention, so when it happened to me, it left me dumbfounded. I shunned it to me being paranoid, tired or just imagining things, but well, every time I stepped into the tree line out of my usual perimeter, a palpable feeling of dread gripped me. Something always seemed amiss, regardless of the tenure of my presence there. Yes, it was betwixt these tales of Vermont legends and my evening strolls when I first caught a glimpse of something preternatural. I was spending the usual inimitable time amongst the several luxuriances nature had to provide, when suddenly a feeling of dread, an ominous feeling, took over my body. The usual walk time was already over, I realized. This realization came late, owing to my weird fascination with the blue warbler, a local bird. The calm, serene atmosphere suddenly took a violent turn as I turned to walk towards my house. I then caught a glimpse of something otherworldly. I stood, frozen in fear and confusion, and began to notice another sinister oddity. The sky had changed. The sky had a vivid red tinge to it. I started repeating the Lord's Prayer. A soft humming sound sparsely echoed around me. Rapid movements escaped from my peripheral vision. Shadows of despicable grotesqueness floated around me. The soft humming sound, now more like a demonic enchantment. A horrible, eldritch entity lurked around me. I wondered, frantically and fearfully. Then it appeared in one of the upstairs windows. Long hair, wide-eyed, possessing a maniacal grin. At first glance, it appeared as if someone was merely looking through the old antediluvian window panes, but Nancy was in town that day. The house was vacant, bathed in utter emptiness, except for me, something unidentifiable. The demonic entity vanished into thin air. Ah, being outside... In an obscure world, watching helplessly as something otherworldly seizes hold of your only safe haven, is a terrifying ordeal. Nothing more happened that day. Nancy arrived the next morning. Oh, you ain't leaving any time soon. I ordered her, as soon as she stepped inside, in a strict tone. A look of utter confusion grabbed her wrinkled face. Okay, sir. She replied, still confused from the amount of contempt in my speech. 
Daytime. The place. The nearby trail of trees. Looked calm as ever. Scintillating, even. Nighttime was a different story altogether. And by virtue of some horrible, blasphemous fate, I can't quite fathom if it was only me who always saw the terrible deeds, the shadow lurking amongst those sinister beds of trees, the lone bearer of that sinister, demonic cacophony. Several trivial incidents followed later, but nothing catastrophic or of cyclopean importance. At one point in time, I regarded it to my ravaging malady, toying with my dwindling fantasy, but what happened next eradicated these merciful doubts. It was late in the night. A cold winter wind blew mercilessly, aggravating the pain between my joints. I was helplessly bedridden. Wearied by the melancholic biblical fables I resigned myself to, staring out into the cold, vast plains of sheer nothingness, it was during my uninterrupted gaze when I heard a queer sound. I listened patiently and recognized it as hard, thumping footsteps coming from the floor below. Someone was scurrying down below. The sound of hurried footsteps echoed hideously in the hall. I mustered all my strength and called, Nancy, in a stern and strident tone while still in my bed, but to no avail. Nancy, I called out again, the anger in my speech grew to a barbaric volume. She won't get to evade the dreadful consequences tomorrow morning, I thought to myself, anger pouring all over my body. Then an ear-piercing screeching sound of the basement door opening emanated in the hallway below. Is it Nancy? I thought again to myself. What was she doing so late down in the basement? The sinister sound of wood creaking was slowly creeping closer and closer. Rays of inexplicable intensities illuminated the interior of my household. Shadows of unspeakable stature formed before me, and a low, guttural, demonic voice echoed in the hallway. It wasn't her, I realized. The gate handle shook maniacally. Layers of dust came off the floor and the wall, and I couldn't help myself but think... What was she up to this whole time? Her idiocy has enraged me before, and this time it has left me in a haunting situation. Did she somehow leave the backyard's gate ajar? How should I deal with this intruder? The questions knew no bound. Panic seized me. The gate handle shook hysterically now, as the low, mysterious growl increased in audacity even more. The intruder didn't sound like any human being at this point. It was something supernatural. A being of the night, I wondered frantically. I desperately looked for somewhere to hide. Something to block the incoming pandemic. Something to keep the atrocious beast at bay. Something to evade my grisly death. I couldn't find one. In a sudden fit of mass hysteria and disillusion, I decided to jump from the window. The pale moonlight cast weird, uncanny shadows onto the backyard. The tree line had hideously crawled forward ever so slightly. I landed awkwardly onto the withered surface. My legs burned from the pain. The wind picked up a severe pace. The swaying branches emanated horrid resonance that no sane human ear should have heard. Then. What came next even perplexes me now. To the reader, not so much, but something queerly inexplicable happened on that full moon night in those forgotten, hideous parts of Vermont. A loud, obnoxious bang followed by the curious sound of shards of wood falling onto the wooden surface. The deep growl reached a crescendo that night, that abhorrent night. I looked back curiously from the tree line into my bedroom, scared what sight it may be presented to behold. Curiosity, morbid curiosity, overpowered the subtle insidious fear in me, but nothing ever came from the dark bedroom. It appeared as if the demonic beast was waiting for its prey to return to its confines. I ran even deeper into the woods, leaving Nancy alone with that demonic creature. 
She deserves this despicable treatment, I thought to myself. My legs ached violently from the fall. Unutterable pain filled my body. My legs gasped for specks of air as the harsh, blowing wind displayed no mercy in slowing my pace. And into a clearing fell my consumptive and tremulous body, the sullen, blanched face meeting the ground first. I woke up to a gruesome sight of a snake engulfing its tail in my backyard. I let out a high-pitched squeal. Gross, I uttered numbly to myself, still visibly shaken. Unheeded questions stormed in my brain. How did I reach my backyard? I raced my way to my bedroom. The door, the sinister door, looked good as ever. Why was the hideous door still intact? The impeccable sound of it breaking into trivialities was surely audible, even in my frenzied state. Nancy's detestable face greeted me on my way down from my bedroom. A horrified expression covered her usual cheerful facade. Sire, you have blood on your face. Sudden feelings of anger and confusion rose inside of me. Oh, I was hunting, I said in an utter derogatory tone. Blood was smeared all over my squalid face. Hundreds of thoughts raced in my still nauseous mind as I desperately prepared to flee, since the scarcity in sources of travel it was mere impossible to arrange motor cars to travel back this late in the day. Perpetual rain had already deteriorated the outskirts. It was impossible. Leaving by foot was never an option. I had to spend the night. One sinister night in those doomed parts of Brattleboro forests. One ominous night betwixt unknown nocturnal cryptids. Against the violent revolts of my fearful brain, I decided to stay. Morning came and went without anything happening. I remained in my study all day, huddled up in a corner with only the sun's warm effulgence to guide my wearied body around. The warm, sultry atmosphere made the study a comfortable resting place. I woke up around five to the ubiquitous chirping of several distinct bird species. The irradiate rays of sun acquired vivid, iridescent colours. The last rays of dusk, before the tormenting night, reached through my window pane onto the open piece of my incomplete writing. Ah, another impeccable idea which wore away with time. I wondered. For some strange reasons, I found none of the hallway lights working. Queer coolness in the evening wind signaled the break of another malicious storm. But ever since my childhood, storms have been fascinating for me. I decided to steal a glance from one of the hallway windows. The thick canopy nearly engulfed everything, it seemed. The fog had started to settle in the nearby tree line. The wind had picked up a severe pace now, as I, bewildered on the fantastic force of nature, something caught my attention. Oh, I still dearly hope that I shouldn't have pulled those curtains up. I shouldn't have peeked. My head still hurts from the awful visual which unfolded before my bleak eyes, now devoid of even the plainest of colours. Even after eternities, when the clouds roar, the lightning strikes, or the fog settles in. A strange feeling of disproportionate fear, mixed with the ever-declining childhood fantasy, rise inside of my shuddering body. I then like to steer away from any window or orifice. I behave irrationally then. As I stood dumbstruck from the raging storm, a strange, ghastly creature peeked back at me from the hideous tree line. Several limbs disjointed. The abhorrent creature was floating somehow. Long hair covering most of its face. A strange vile liquid dripping from its rotting body. The being stood, leering, protruding a demented, ungodly look. An ominous grin at me. I immediately backed away from the window. Something wicked was coming my way. Nancy, I yelled frantically. 
she was nowhere to be seen. Weird, ghastly figures escaped in my peripheral. The house was uncannily darker than the rest of the days. Outside, the storm gained full momentum. A single flash of lightning bolt sent me racing back into my study. The place which was the only safe haven, excluded and in recluse from the rest of the world. The satisfying click of dead bolts echoed in the empty room. I drifted back. Something in the cool autumnal wind made me seek the perpetual solace of sleep once again. Around half past twelve, a menacing, demonical shriek was heard coming from the basement. I got up from my deep slumber, still noticeably hazy and incoherent. The sounds of nocturnal hours and heavy downpour greeted me as I opened my creaking door. A new sense of horror and oppression filled my mind as I sensed something horrific was about to manifest itself hideously in front of my bloodshot eyes. I cursed my creaking door for sounding too loud, for I was too afraid to seek the attention of whatever nyctophiliac decided to seek refuge in my home on this dreary, haunting night. It took me a few seconds to notice the basement door was hurtling in and out, creating the same deafening, ear-piercing, screeching noise. Nancy, I called out. No answer. Nancy, I called out again. Still no answer. Heaven propagated no mercy as buckets of rainwater were splashing onto my roof every second. The lightning flashes became more and more violent. The swerving tress outside the window jarred a weird, inexplicable, haunting look, as now and then sinister flashes illuminated those horrid branches. I decided to take a horrific decision to confront... to confront... Whatever abhorrent abomination resided in the nethermost points of my rotting abode. The wooden stairs decided to turn their back against me as they mercilessly creaked on the way down. Then came the hallway. For some strange peculiar reason, Nancy forgot to shut off the blinds. I could swear I saw movements betwixt the bushes, the shrubs and those sick trees. Vile, putrid smells emanated from the hall. The screeching sound grew more violent as I inched my way closer to the devil. Unspeakable pain protruded in my left leg as I tripped on a piece of wooden furniture and let out a low yelp. The pain soon vanished into oblivion as something altogether different made my sanity disappear into nothingness. The last nail in the coffin, I suppose, as after that period I remember scarcely of the events as it was at that moment I decided to finally get away from that impious, sacrilegious land. As I tripped on the wooden chair, I glanced under it for a moment, and under it laid the dead, lifeless remains of Nancy, her eyes still wide open from shock or fear, the origins of which still remain unclear. The cause of her horrific mutilation may very well remain an unsolved, perplexed mystery to the authorities as well. Several of her limbs missing, chewed out at best. I let out a horrific scream, and in no way tried to muffle my reaction, as whatever laid down in the basement was not my concern anymore. Painstakingly, I got up, ready to dart outside under the night sky, into the damp, unforgiving woods, and suddenly the thing downstairs did not feel the urge to entertain the idea of living downstairs any more. The basement door wasn't moving now. The stairs, those hellish steps leading towards the basement, now creaked horridly one by one. Step by step, something was making its way towards the upper level, towards me, to do whatever it had done to Nancy. I raced my way outside, leaving the mangled corpse of Nancy lying down there in a desperate attempt to slow down the maniac who was now free from whatever unearthly bounds had kept him dormant down in the basement. The downpour was still rampant. The flashes no longer unveiled sinister Arcanus, but now blinded me too. I heard my front door tear open in a quick frenzy, and a growl of hysterical rage was now emanating in the woods in either direction. 
the portentous canopy stretched out into the vast, interminable night sky, which once fascinated me, but now induced an outrage of fear in my depraved vessel. I tripped again. Something snapped in the lower parts of my torso. Shards of pain radiated in my body. I was hurt miserably, but despite the aching pain, I continued my helpless and futile run in hopes of finding a hiding spot to spend the rest of the night in to prevent myself from stumbling onto the same miserable fate that dear Nancy had met, to prevent myself from coming across the same untimely demise. Though, as a result of some horrific past life deeds or just pure blasphemous fate, I shall not fathom. My legs finally gave way and I fell face down into a squalid ditch, sprawling with all kind of micro-life, abundant with small rodents and insects of various grotesqueness, the only speck of wildlife I encountered on that dreaded, ungrateful night. My drudgerous life was over, I thought mercilessly to myself, still lying lethargically in the dirt. The sounds of heavy footsteps echoed in the nearby tree line surrounding me. I tried to lay still, in a last desperate attempt to camouflage myself in the night. It went in vain, just like my every other folly attempt to seek refuge from the unnamed. Then, finally came the dreaded abnormality, which I still dearly believe is responsible for the horrific annihilation of Nancy. Conjured up from the deepest recesses of hell, the cacodemonical being stood towering before me, staring blankly into my soul with those hollowed-out, feverish eyes. I laid still, unmoving. Those eyes. I still shiver by the very thoughts of those eyes. Those eyes were the worst of all. It still induces a disproportionate amount of nightmares in my transient sleeps. Those tormenting, feverish eyes made my soul shiver. My trivial existence trembled in front of the cyclopean monstrosity which now stood uncannily still in the night. The sinister flash revealed a plethora of other fiendish details. The being stood on its hind legs. It may have been a carnivore at some point of its abnormal life. Queerly enough, it looked humanoid in shape, not much different from a regular human. And, with almost inhuman speed, it disappeared back into the tree line. The terrifying encounter left me pondering on the palpable concern. Why was I still alive? Soon after, my mind faded into obscurity. Sleep came as a deliverance. In my dream, though, I saw those eyes again, those haunting, abysmal eyes, reflecting nothing but darkness and grief. Dread, doom, and despair drip from those eyes, even guilty somehow, but what are regret and remorse to a deranged monstrosity like that? I soon found out. I woke up bathed in garish effulgence, physical pain no longer in existence. The room felt extremely bright, weird machinery beeping in unanimous monotone. A hospital room of some sort. Captivated by some uncanny lustrous metal, my struggle proved to be extremely futile. A nurse, probably in her mid-twenties, entered the grim room. She understood the palpable disillusion. I asked her to clear the phantasm, steer me away from the irradiate refuge of delusion and lies. I wasn't prepared for the truth, though. I never had been. The wonder and awe, the fascination I once had for the human brain, now stood muddled up in a damp corner of my rotting sanity. For the fear that those demented visions would never really leave my depraving sanity, and would swerve my dying body back into the recesses of lunacy. Just like that slithering reptile who was en route to eating its tail, carving my way towards eternal damnation, I ate my decaying sanity all along just like that venomous reptile. She explained the horrific truth for the umpteenth time, I speculated, wandering from her bleak, 
an expressionless face. It had been years since I'd been apprehended. I am in a lunatic asylum for the criminally insane and was found guilty of killing Nancy, stabbing her multiple times in her sleep. The sick disease exaggerated, magnified my insidious hate for her. Disheartened by the disorientation of my disjointed visions, I decided not to argue. There was never a rabid beast in those Vermont woods, just my imagination. Just my dementia-stricken brain and a cruel, disdain phantasm that has driven me hideously to an unimaginable and unspeakable end. But I refuse to believe her, and I never will. No, it was never the dementia that killed Nancy and made me insane, but the demon, the sick, abhorrent abomination inside my ever-decaying brain. So, um, God, I really enjoy reading stories written in that style. It is hard work, though. Uh, Lovecraft is not easy to pull off if you're going to imitate his style of writing, but when it's done well, it really is a joy. Very, very tough. Um, requires um, an entire different cadence. You've got to approach it from a completely different point of view. Uh, so, um, lots and lots of re-recorded sentences in that one, I can tell you. <laughs> but worth it in the end, I hope you'll agree. Well, that's enough for me for one evening, but of course, of course, I will be back again very soon. Well, I'm going to see the WWE tomorrow. Seth Rollins will be there, AJ Styles will be there, and I am so excited, I can't tell you. But I will be back again with you on Wednesday. Till then, sweet dreams and bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now... Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so come check me out, okay? <laughs>